<laughs> okay, sorry. good morning, and I'm sorry for the technical issue you have today. And welcome to the session. The session is New Tech, 5G, and Risk to the Internet. Actually, I am the backup MC for the session. The official MC should be Jarong, so I try to hand over to Jarong. Uh, Jarong, please, your turn. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Jarong, and I'm based in Singapore. I work for ICANN. I'm the Vice President and Managing Director of the Asia Pacific Office. I'm very happy to be here joining online. Uh, again, under normal circumstances, I would be seated next to Kenny, also wearing a suit. But uh, today I'm wearing a normal shirt, um, dialing in from home. So I hope everyone can bear with me. Um, so we've submitted a session today. Uh, but before we talk about the problem statements and what we're hoping to address, um, let me introduce the speakers. So we have uh, uh, four speakers with us, uh, and uh, I'm co-moderating this session together with Kenny. Uh, I, we've had various experiences of having speakers dial in remotely uh, with participants in the conference room, and it tends to be that uh, it's harder to engage with you without being in person. So we're hoping Kenny can help us with that, you know, so if uh, people are uh, having questions or you want to raise a question, feel free to uh, raise your hand and, and let Kenny know so that we can engage you uh, and address any questions or discussion points you might have. Now, introducing the speakers. So Kenny, everybody knows, is our co-moderator today. And also we have Chapika Vijayatunga, who also works for ICANN. He's our uh, technical regional engagement manager. Uh, working for the office of the CTO. And also we have our next speaker is Joyce. Um, Joyce is APNIC's Senior Advisor for Strategic Engagement. Uh, earlier this year, she was still working with us in ICANN, uh, but she's since moved to APNIC. Uh, and the third speaker is uh, Bill Ko. He is the Director of Systems Design Division uh, Technology Group of Taiwan Mobile. So we look forward to having um, his perspectives from an uh, operator perspective uh, from the industry. And also joining us from the Pacific Islands is uh, Dalsi Baniela, who is the Telecommunications Regulatory Advisor to the Government of Palau. Uh, so she will help to provide some perspectives from the government side. Now, very quickly, touching on the topic for today. Um, we tend to talk quite a lot about the internet at risk of being fragmenting or at risk of being, becoming broken. Um, it comes from various conversations. Um, some of them are policy or legislative. Some of them are from geopolitics. Uh, and it ranges from various things like, you know, internet blocking, um, the ability to access uh, the internet even. So one other aspect of this more recent discussions, um, and it's not exactly new, but what about new technologies like 5G, for example? Would it have an impact on the internet being fragmented? So today we hope to explore uh, firstly on this area and we will broaden the conversation back to um, the risk of the internet fragmenting from various perspectives. So this is where we will invite the panelists to share with us. Um, then we will come back and have a broader discussion with everyone on the floor uh, in the conference room uh, on this question. Is our internet at risk and, and why is it important for us to maintain a single, single and global internet? So the broader agenda really is um, we will first have Champika just talk about how the internet works to level set for us to understand um, what we think about when it comes to internet fragmentation. Then from there, we will then have the panel discussion and discussion with everybody in the room. If everybody is happy with that, then let's move to having Champika uh, talk us through very quickly uh, about how the internet works so that we can all be on the same page when we start the discussion. 
Chapika, over to you, please. Thank you, Jaron. Uh, good morning, all, and uh, it's it's a pleasure to uh, be here at the uh, event, uh, at least in a virtual form. So, uh, as Jaron said, um, I will give a uh, very quick intro about how the internet works, and um, and then we can uh, follow up with the panel discussion. So, if I could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so. Uh, as you uh, as you can see here, now um, when you talk about the the internet, um, it's all based on a protocol called TCP/IP. Maybe you have already heard about this, and TCP/IP was uh, developed quite a long time ago, about more than sort of forty years ago or so, and um, so. Um, when you think of TCP IP, uh, it's all based on layers. Uh, it's a kind of layered architecture, as you can see in the diagram. And um, so you can see that there are four layers when you consider TCP IP. Uh, the topmost layer is basically the application layer. This is where the users would interact. So when you even speak of internet nowadays, as you all know, it is a, a Big network and it is a single uh, net one big network, but we have a lot of applications uh, running. Uh, so the users would interact uh, between you know these applications and send the data from one place uh, to another place, so or one host to another host, or one device to another device. So the topmost layer is basically application layer. So this is where even, uh, for example, you can also see some applications like uh, even if you think of a browser, we use uh, protocols like HTTPS and so on. Uh, even DNS, um, the domain name system, also is, is, is an application which is actually in the application layer itself, in the topmost layer. Now, the uh, second layer is, is actually the transport layer. Um, so these, as you all know, the applications would, you know, get the uh, input, the data, uh, as as um, as bits, and and then this needs to be uh, packaged to send to another place or another host. So in the transport layer, we do all that uh, uh, packaging, uh, and and uh, so there are some protocols involved here. So. You can see in the slide, uh, I have put a couple of protocols that have been used in the internet, uh, TCP and UDP. TCP is Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP is Universal Datagram Protocol. protocol. Um, UDP is actually more of a connection-less uh, protocol, whereas TCP is what we call a connection-oriented protocol. Because when we use these uh, protocols, for example, um, some protocols need more reliability, things like error corrections and so on. So TCP has uh, has got uh, more reliability factor there uh, with things like error correction because when it comes to TCP, um, it, it, it establishes a connection based on certain handshakes. Um, and that is why we call it as connection-oriented uh, protocol. Uh, whereas UDP uh, doesn't do that, uh, it, it actually just send the uh, data. Uh, you may have some um, uh, packet losses, but still uh, it is quick and um, it is much more efficient. Now, when you think of the uh, next level, the third layer, so we have you know we have done all the packaging and so on. Next step is is basically to send these packets from one place to another place. So this is where we have to provide uh, directions to those packets, where these packets should be going, uh, where it should be destined, and so on. So this is where the IP addressing would come in. Uh, so we have to give some directions where the packets should go. So these packets would contain uh, things called headers. And, and the, in these packet headers, uh, you will have a source IP address and a destination IP address. And actually, even the routing function happens um, uh, in this layer as well, because uh, uh, the routers would inspect these packet headers and then forward it uh, to 
another router basically until the destination is reached. So network layer, uh, we that's where we do simply you know things like uh, address IP addressing basically. Um, and then uh, the bottommost layer is actually the physical layer. Uh, so to do all that, so once once give the, we give the directions and so on to the packets, we have to have some physical networks to send these packets from one place to another place. So this is where, you know, even we have been using various uh, access technologies in this layer uh, historically uh, and, and uh, over the time. And uh, so some examples, uh, if you consider nowadays, you know, some examples are things like Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or even, you know, all those uh, uh, different communications mediums are, are, are all in this layer, in this physical layer. So this TCPI stack has to be uh, enabled in, or oh, basically, you know, it should be available in in, in different devices so that uh, using this stack, uh, we can communicate between those devices. So this is basically how, uh, you know, the uh, data communication happens when it considers today's internet. I mean, it has been the same over the last uh, many years, but um, of course, you know, there have been various uh, improvements and advancements to the uh, uh, to these protocols and and, and so on uh, and and then the security factor and so on there have been a lot of enhancements to this uh, but you know the principally uh, TCPIP has been used uh, uh, for the data communications uh, in the internet so if I go to the next slide please now um, so earlier I was going through a TCPIP layer. Uh, different layers. In all these different layers, we have different uh, identifiers uh, because you know we, we have to have identifiers in in uh, in these layers. So if you consider the topmost layer, the application layer, the identifier what we use is basically uh, the DNS. So as you may know, uh, uh, so I was just saying in this slide. Um, now earlier we spoke about different layers in TCP/IP. So in, in these different layers, we have uh, things called identifiers. And uh, so when you consider the uh, application layer, in the application layer, we, we use this uh, identifier uh, called domain names. And, and as you all know, um, you're quite familiar with uh, domain names. We have a proper structured naming system, uh, which is shown in this diagram. There's a proper hierarchy. And uh, also, mm, there's a proper delegation process. DNS is a distributed database and um, uh, with a proper uh, naming uh, structure. Now, uh, that's in the application layer. And also, actually, uh, when it comes to the transport layer, we also have things like port numbers and so on. But I also want to focus more on to the um, network layer. I told you there, that's where we give directions, you know, where these packets should be going. And uh, so this is where we use um, uh, IP addresses and, and routing. Uh, so when, when it comes to IP addresses, uh, we have IP version 4 and IP version 6. Uh, IP version 4 has been used, uh, again, uh, for a long time since, since the uh, starting of pretty much you know, TCP IP uh, for nearly like four, four decades now. And uh, IPv6 also we have been using for last uh, 20 years or so. So um, in, in, in public you know, networks, we have been using IPv6 networks. And um, so it is also actually been um, used in, in uh, many uh, networks now. Now, uh, also we have another type of internet identifier, uh, which is called an autonomous system numbers. Uh, that is what actually uh, showed, showed in the, uh, the bottom diagram. So this is involved mostly, uh, I mean, this is involved uh, for routing purposes. Now, I told you that even in, in network layer, we do routing as well, because routing is a very important function uh, in data communications when you send packets from one place to another place. Uh, because all these hosts, hosts can be uh, uh, put into certain networks, and the collection of these networks um, can be put under certain administrative and control. And uh, this is where uh, 
the autonomous systems numbers would come into the picture. So simply autonomous system is a collection of networks with the same uh, routing policy. And um, so we use these autonomous system numbers as well and, and they are uh, another type of identifier. Uh, and also in the bottom most layer, again, we also have uh, IP address, so we also have identifiers like uh, physical addresses like MAC addresses and so on. If I go to the next slide, please. All right, so we, we talked about now TCP IP and also actually, uh, you know, different identifications and so on. So now uh, we have this uh, discussion about, uh, especially, you know, considering these different new technologies. Uh, now our context here is to talk about 5G and the current model of internet. Now, over the years, uh, we have seen many access technologies that has been used, right, over the years. Uh, it could be things like, you know, say in, in frame relays or ATMs or, you know, all, all these different type of access uh, network technologies and, you know, and Ethernet and so on, Wi-Fi and so on. So even when considering the uh, cellular network networks, we have seen... Um, uh, you know, early cellular networks like what, what we used to call 1G or one, one first generation phones, uh, mostly analog phones um, came in 1980s, 90s. And then we saw like 2G phones came in the 1990s where we could send uh, SMS and so on, uh, but uh, based on digital uh, communication. And then in, in the 2000s, we saw 3G networks or 3G cellular networks. So this is where really... Um, we could use uh, internet, especially in you know, things like browsing using these 3G devices. And then uh, 2010, basically in the last decade, um, we saw uh, 4G networks. Uh, and this is where even we had more higher uh, data transfer rates. And also uh, we could uh, also use actually things like streaming and, and so on. Uh, we could use things for streaming and, and so on. Uh, and and so here we are talking about the 5G context, uh, especially now 2020 onwards for the next decade um, uh, until like 2030 or so. Uh, for this decade, uh, 5G is is a focus here in this discussion. So uh, in in 5G, actually, uh, it is just more than uh, just browsing or or sending emails or mobile apps. More than that. So there are various um, uh, objectives have been uh, put together by different standard development bodies and as well as uh, different forums and so on. So one of the uh, important criteria uh, is actually for our discussion today is, is to talk about this uh, network slicing uh, feature in, in 5G. Uh, when you think of net, because in, in the recent past, there have been a lot of development in relation to um, say, the software-defined networks and, and network virtualizations and so on. So uh, we are sort of moving from more physical uh, systems to more virtualized systems. So it is also very important that uh, we consider this virtualized function in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in this um, uh, mobile world as well. So here uh, we are talking of different applications, say, for example, like um, uh, Internet of things, uh, talking between IoT devices, uh, vehicle to vehicle type communications, and uh, various you know, uh, remote or, or uh, medical applications and, and things like that. So uh, 5G has a big focus there. So with network slicing actually um, is, is, is a focus where we can create uh, virtual networks or, or virtual functions, logical networks, to suit these applications. So that's, uh, this also has raised some concerns uh, where whether this network slicing function can uh, be a reason for uh, say the fragmentation of internet. So I think I, I will, um, I will uh, stop here because you know, this would lead into our uh, discussion now uh, in relation to the fragmentation of internet and, and, so, and, and, and whether this, this could um, be a threat to the internet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Champika. 
All right, so that's very helpful just to help level set and we understand what internet fragmentation means um, at the fundamental level. Um, now let's go into the panel discussion and um, we'll take 15 minutes for this first segment. Um, the first question, before we jump into really about the various kinds of fragmentation that could happen, uh, Let's take a step back and ask ourselves a, a very important question since we are having a discussion on Internet Governance Forum. So the, the broader question is really, why is a single interoperable internet important? And um, let's uh, ask the views of our panelists first. Then we can also invite some views from the participants in the audience. And I will trouble Kenny to help uh, with, with that as well. But let's share. Let's have our panelists share their views uh, on this. So perhaps we can go in this order. Champika, you, you've already went, so you can come back last. Uh, let's go to Joyce, please. Uh, from your perspective and from the numbering community, why is a single interoperable internet important? Hi, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay. 大家早上好，我是Joyce，来自新加坡。代表APNIC感谢主持人Kenny和ICAN的邀请来参加今日的TWIGF。能和大家分享这段期间真的是我的荣幸。我现在就转回英语来发表一些意见,还请多多包涵。So um, APNIC, or Asia Pacific Network Information Center, is an open, member-based, not-for-profit organization. Our primary role is to distribute and manage internet number of resources. So you heard earlier from um, Champika talking about um, IP addresses and autonomous system numbers, or AS numbers. Um, and we do this in the Asia-Pacific region's 56 economies. So IP addresses enable devices to connect to one another, and AS numbers allow devices to find one another more efficiently. And this is the foundation of the internet. We are part of the underlying infrastructure that make the global internet work. As a user, you don't see different networks but you experience a seamless global internet. This is in part because of the IP addressing system. So how it works is basically like a glue. It allows you to connect and communicate. And once you, have, or once you stop having a single interoperable internet, you defeat the purpose of the whole internet. The success of the internet is that it is held together in an invisible and stable manner. You've heard the term interoperable internet. Now, what does that mean? It basically explains how one network can work with other networks as part of a global system. This happens by adopting open standards that allow the seamless interconnectedness between networks. In this way, diversity is supported, but systems continue to interoperate. Individual network operators are free to do whatever they want within their own network, but the internet as a whole continues to function because the focus is on interoperation that is defined within open standards. So from a technical point of view, the network was designed in such a way to be out of any one person or organization's control. This decentralized architecture is one fundamental reason for the internet's success and growth. Together with a packet switching approach, we now have the most efficient and successful way to transmit data over a network of networks. This way of routing packets is already the most widespread communication system in the world. When you have a network architecture that is already open, decentralized, and efficient, any system or technology that is closed, centralized, and over-regulated will find it very hard to grow globally, less so at the same speed as the internet has grown. So sometimes the need for control due to security or other considerations seems to be worthwhile, particularly when communications transmit sensitive or compromising information. So a lot of people are trying new technologies that can have an adverse effect on the global reach of the internet. There are indeed risks of fragmentation at the protocol addressing or DNS level, attempting to isolate certain portions of the network. As part of the internet community, what we should protect is not the network architecture per se, because by definition, it is designed to be out of control. 
the technical community has a role to play in keeping packets flowing as fast and efficiently as possible through different networks. And keeping this ecosystem running requires many efforts, for example, of organizations uh, that you see today, APNIC, TWNIC, and ICANN. To ensure that nothing breaks the internet and that it continues to be available, we need to protect the values and principles of open and accessible internet. Let's work together on protecting these values and principles so that the internet stays resilient and remains available to everyone. I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you, Joyce. Those are very helpful points made. Uh, key thing, key words, takeaways from me are, you know, the, the importance to protect uh, the values of an open, interoperable internet, that the internet itself is decentralized, um, but at the same time, uh, and then also the roles of the technical community, uh, which are extremely important. Now let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Same question, but um, direct the question to Bill. From your perspective, from an operator's perspective, um, why do you think the internet needs to be single and interoperable? Why is it important? Over to you, please, Bill. Can I change it to my slide? Uh, uh, because I, I prepared some slides, so can I use the slide? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, trouble the technical team on the in the conference room. Yeah. Okay. The first style I want to show that is a uh, we have only one uh, one word, and uh, you can see see that all the world we have a global trade trading map like this one, and uh, you can find the same with the subsea cable. So. All the trade, uh, economic and the trading system in the world is the same with our fiber, our subsea cable. And also you can find that all the internet, something like the uh, trading system or all the ca uh, cable or the telephone line is the same. We have all one world and we have one internet. So it is important to have one world, to have one internet, because people would like to do the trading, would have economic activity with the other people. Uh, in the beginning or in the uh, <coughs> future, we will buy the internet. And in the beginning, we use the voice, we use the data for the 2G, 3G, for, uh, and currently we will have 5G, and later on we will use 5G to communicate with the other people. But it is based on people, and the people want to communicate with each other. To, uh, to do that, we, have, we need to have one tool or the same tool to provide the, the uh, communication service from each one to the other one. So we think that we should keep the same, uh, what, the same internet, the one internet, because we have only one word. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Will. I think that's very insightful as well. Uh, if you come uh, as an analogy to look at uh, using the internet as a, a platform, not unlike trade. So trade, you trade goods. In the case of internet, you trade ideas, you trade uh, information. So if we block that free trade and everyone understands trade, that would benefit everybody. Um, if we block trade, uh, then people only stand to lose. So the same concept applies for uh, an open internet as well. That's very, very insightful. Um, let's move to Dalsi. Uh, can you share your views from a government perspective? Um, how important is it for us to maintain a single and global interoperable internet? Dalsi, over to you. Thank you, and thank you very much for giving this opportunity once more to share with you views from the government. Um, the national government priorities, as always, 
agenda and focus is always built on the sustainable development goals. We, we heard from many specific presentations, including at the UN Global Internet Forum 2020, that internet plays a vital role in achieving sustainable development goals. And at the same time, we heard from the key international stakeholders, including the International Telecommunications Union, and at the national level, the importance of collaboration to address digital divide and other challenges faced that contributed to digital divide. So maturity of the national ICT related policy directions and the regulatory framework needs to be revised, giving an example, the Republic of Palau's legislation framework are centered around mobile force services and the physical and network infrastructure. So in reality, citizens are currently enjoying benefits of over-the-top services, IoT, multi multimedia services at their own risks. At the same time, recognizing the many benefits of 5G and its disadvantages, it is to be introduced if it is to be introduced in respective island nations. So in the last 10 years, one of the major challenges that the government is facing and is still today is limited technical expertise and the development of policy and regulatory framework that will cater for such important technical aspects of internet development. If at the national level, there is a gap existed for leaders and users to understand, transform, and accept technology evolution. This has also contributed to slow progression for the government to take positive steps forward to contribute on directions that is more favorable for, the, for its citizens. There are many internet users and leaders today who are very concerned about internet fragmentation. If there are policies and regulations in place that mandate us to roll out access to internet services and is where our focus is, and at the same time, trying to catch up with regulatory framework to cater for internet activities, including data privacy, net neutrality, interoperability, cybersecurity, and more others, then comes the impact of internet fragmentation. There is definitely a big issue for many of us leaders to work on. Let's go further on the main concerns in our view, views that are stimulators of internet fragmentation. For example, cost of access to the global internet is already a problem. Comparing a small island state like the Republic of Palau with international business centers in New York or London. On the other hand, for example, Vanuatu government is now working towards its e-government service integration. So if network slicing will positively impact the internet, the e-government service integration, then maybe, maybe, the government will support the rollout of 5G. Having discussed the earlier views, the key issue still remains today is to connect the unserved and the underserved population to internet services. For a simple and a digital illiterate user of internet, experiencing technical fragmentation will lead to more and more disconnected experiences. Then comes another challenge that is contributing to digital divide, cost building internet infrastructure across many islands that are separated by waters, for example. Let's also look at the ability to use content services, for example, Netflix and more others. There might be copyright restrictions at the national operations. 
that could limit the ability to have access to the content services unless we choose to perform illegal access, which we want to make sure users of internet are not heading in that direction. So access to e-commerce building block is another concern, such as e-payment systems and at the same time, physical delivery of payments. Again, there's already a challenge that is impacting and could impact the potential of local e-commerce businesses. Not to mention the assurance of the rights of the citizens in terms, in terms of protection of their privacy and also law enforcement, the ability for local police force, for example, to obtain e-evidence from overseas, I would expect that would be practical, practical impossible. In fact, some arguments are only potentially problematic. Others may have identified are actually problematic. It would be foolish for any internet user or leader in the world to think of internet, to think the internet fragmentation problems will just go away, as some leaders have thought would happen with COVID-19. I think going forward in an inclusive way, it would be appropriate to identify the highest level of problematic examples of current or highly likely potential fragment fragmentation of the internet at both the technical and content and transaction layers, a number that is workable, then weigh their respective significance and necessity of taking steps to address them, both at the national and international level, with a direction and link through UN SDGs and the national ICT-related policy mandates. From there, maybe the actual steps to overcome the problem or issue needs to be determined, shared on a worldwide level to get common agreement and action plan put in place. So the plan, the action must, the action plan must have clear defined outcomes required and a time frame for them to be met by. In this way, implementers would have a guide to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Delcy. Um, quite a lot of uh, very insightful points that you've made. And um, in fact, some of the points you made directly links to the next question I have for everybody. Um, but before we go there, um, maybe we can take a step back first. And uh, can you, um, are there any participants in the room with any questions or any comments currently? regarding the importance of a, a single internet. Okay, uh, I have an ask. If you have any question regarding to, to our first question, is a single interoperable internet is important? Uh, if you have any question regarding to, and or you want to share your view, please go to the mic. And when you go to the mic, please say your name or your affiliation. Thank you. Any question for the first one? Please go to the mic. Uh, thank you for the panelists' insightful uh, presentations. My name is Hong Ming Yao. My name is Hong Ming Yao, and uh, uh, I'm from the National Defense University. I have questions regarding the fragmentations. It seems like we need a presentation. We heard two different kind of fragmentations. One is vertical. One is horizontal. The vertical probably refers to uh, we talk about the network slicing. So that gave me an impression like uh, before we use have the uh, ATM network, you uh, have different kind of requirement, quality of service for different kind of transmission. So you want to slide your network. That's what I mean by saying vertical. And uh, horizontal would be like the last speaker talk about how geopolitical factor have been um, uh, 
immediate force to break the internet into multiple uh, segments. So my question would be like uh, from panelist view. Do you believe that uh, both of them are bad for the internet? Or maybe one is more destructive and the other is not? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jarong, have you heard the question clear? Yes, loud and clear and very good question. Uh, I think it's also a good segue to the next portion, but let's have uh, our panelists. Uh, I think this one is worth having everyone share their view. Uh, uh, you know, do we think both uh, in, in terms of the question, vertical or horizontal fragmentation um, by our participants' definition? Are they both bad or um, how would you see it differently? So perhaps we can go along the list of um, each speaker just sharing very quickly what your views are uh, for a couple of minutes. Uh, can we have Champika first? Uh, yeah, in, in fact, actually, um, uh, it, it, it depends, for example, that... Um, Say when it, when you when you're speaking of fragmentation, say uh, if um, if it depends on whether we are going to use public identifiers or kind of private identifiers as well. And um, when when you are talking, say uh, I you know, based on the definition what you mentioned, uh, I could even consider say. Uh, Things like virtu virtu uh, vertical uh, fragmentation is, is, you know, within within an enterprise, you you would still prefer to have some uh, some say uh, your own identifiers, or it could be even private identifiers. Uh, in fact, that still exists. Uh, for example, there are uh, say certain uh, IoT uh, deployments. You know, you know, there are very specific protocols. Uh, which talk, you know, communicate based on uh, proprietary protocols. So it can still exist without harming the uh, one single global internet what we have. Uh, but if if you're talking of, say, um, you know, horizontal type fragmentation where uh, in, in, a, in a bigger network, uh, if we are going to use some private identifiers, uh, definitely, you know that that would contribute to fragmentation out there. Thank you, Champika. I think that's very helpful. Um, let's go to Joyce. Um, what are your views regarding the question? Thanks very much for the question. Um, I, I will talk a little bit more about this in the next section when we're talking about the risks and threats of fragmentation. Uh, but I just want to say, I guess quickly, I do agree with what Champika has mentioned. Um, it's very hard to determine what exactly is bad. Uh, I think it's definitely not ideal if there's going to be fragmentation at the technical layer. I think vertically it would not be as problematic if it's still interoperable, it can coexist um, and complement the current system. Now, the question of geopolitical or you know, political type fragmentation, that is a lot more challenging um, to tackle. But I think also there's opportunity there, which I will go you know, into a little bit more later on. So thanks very much for the question. Thanks, Joyce. I, I think um, I can speak for the technical community here. Um, just like what Joyce mentioned earlier regarding the importance of the values and to keep the internet architecture running, uh, keeping internet open and interoperable. These are key. Um, so as long as this is maintained, the, from a technical community perspective, um, then there is no bad uh, per se. Um, but as for the other aspect, the geopolitical or even on the content side, um, those are aspects that are, um, in fact, more challenging. And I think it's a good segue to ask uh, Dalsi first. Bill, then I'll come back to you. But Dalsi, from your perspective, you know, um, what, what's your view on this one? Thank you. Um, I think it depends very much on the definition of vertical and horizontal. So the horizontal, as it's describing the situation of having a mass 
connection across uh, borders, then I think it's very important to maintain and consider a single internet in the variability. This is because, as I have indicated earlier, there's a lot of work done now at the national level trying to connect the unconnects. So if we are to start with the network slicing, then that's another disturbance in the development. Thank you. Thank you, Dulcy. And very quickly, let's go to Bill from, from operator's perspective. Um, what are your views? Thank you. Um, in a uh, operator point of view, because we are uh, internet service operator and also the mobile service operator, so for the operator point of view, we would like to do the vertical application from the improving the network uh, service, improving the mo user mobility, Im improving the performance of enterprise. So for our local or, or our customer, we want to improve the performance. So use the vertical, vertical solution to improve the mobility or performance is an easy and a quick way to do that. But for the internet uh, application, we also want to do the horizontal communication with each other. So we also want to keep one network, one internet to do the communicate. So for the performance for within our tech, uh, tech uh, catalog, we would like to do the vertical. But for communicate to the each other, for the, the other part, the other uh, country or the other ISP, we like to do the horizontal. So I don't think it's a uh, conflict. It may be what, what's your purpose to improve the, the purpose of user. So it's my, my, my opinion. Thank, Thank you, Bill. I think that is very, very helpful, especially from the operator's perspective. Um, I'm mindful of time. So perhaps we can move on to the next segment because it ties in with the participants' question so well. So I think we can really zoom into the next section, um, ask, and uh, the question for the panelists, uh, some of the, the points, uh, so the question is, what are risks or threats that could fragment the internet from the various perspectives? And Dalsi, you already covered a number of issues there. So perhaps um, we can come back to you on this later. Uh, so the question again is, what are risks or threats that could fragment the internet? Um, there are various perspectives, that, uh, like the participant just now raised, like vertical versus horizontal. Um, let's go to the panelists for your views, and then we can have a broader discussion again. Uh, Champika, let's come to you first uh, on this. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I was just saying that uh, I, I could possibly go through a uh, couple of slides in this case that uh, that uh, we have put together. I think uh, um, that that could uh, align with what I'm going to talk. Okay, let's do that. Give me a second. I will share my screen. Okay. Yeah. So as I, okay, I hope you can hear me. Yes, very good to Okay, yes, right. Uh, so as, as I said, you know, uh, Jarong was actually um, uh, talking about the threats uh, in terms of uh, you know, what sort of threats can, uh, can be there for the internet uh, based on these uh, points what we discussed. So f fragmentation is something, uh, something that, uh, that is one of the uh, biggest concerns that um, many parties have, um, especially with this uh, network slicing aspect that I, I talked to you earlier. Uh, because in, in 5G, specifically in 5G, uh, you can have this uh, virtual lo or logical 
uh, slices, so what we call ne- network slices. Now, you have to go um, one step back and also actually consider, okay, why in the first place uh, 5G, uh, what are the sort of design principles or, or objectives uh, in, in 5G? It's not ju- it's, it is not just uh, the uh, usual internet, what, what we... Uh, uh, what we actually uh, do now, for example, things like browsing and so on. So considering this aspect, one expectation is quite high uh, bandwidth, right? Uh, this could be even going up to something like uh, 20 uh, gigabits per second, you know, things like that. So it's very high sort of bandwidth that we are expecting here. And then uh, also we we talk about uh, the... Um, the um, the number of nodes or, or devices. This is specifically targeted at things like uh, IoT, and uh, also you know, uh, especially you know, if if there are um, many devices or, or uh, if there are things like even if there are devices in in vehicles, say for example, if vehicle to vehicle communication is involved, you know, these are again various applications that you would see. And also there are other applications that you would also expect things like uh, very low uh, latency requirement. In fact, actually, uh, uh, I would say even uh, ultra low uh, uh, latency requirements, especially for things like remote, um, say, operations in in the medical or even uh, if there are some self-driving type of vehicles, you need a lot of uh, uh, time-sensitive applications in this case. So these are some of the reasons. So this is also why I actually the uh, network slicing features would come into the picture or these logical or virtual networks would come into the picture. Say, for example, um, you can give one slice for, for an enterprise who would operate devices, or you could give one slice for uh, a certain application that uh, would need high bandwidth for, say, a streaming type thing. And also, you know, it would break into further slices. Say, uh, one enterprise could use one slice uh, for one purpose at a certain time, and then um, that you can... I lost the sound from Champika. Is it just me? I lost the sound as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we lost you here too, Champika. It's good to know that this time it's everyone losing you. I mean, it's not good, but... <laughs> Okay, we can't hear Champika. Um, so for for time, uh, Champika, I think you raised a couple of good points here. Um, you know that there are various aspects to this, uh, and that one point here on the slide, my takeaway from it is that um, the proprietary networks uh, can still be used without affecting the global internet. Um, let's move on very quickly uh, for sake of time, Joyce. Um, What are your views on uh, any risks or threats that could fragment the internet from your perspective? Thanks, Daryl. Yes, sure. Um, So I want to share four um, issues. Um, One is increasing political action in cyberspace, or what some of us might call modern cyber warfare. Um, The recent US team network initiative can be seen as a political action that calls into question um, you know, what we've just talked about, the values and principles of open and accessible internet. Cyberspace and internet technologies are, you know, from, from my view, um, increasingly becoming the proxy battleground for trade wars, um, for economies to carry out sanctions. Um, we know that cyberspace is a negotiated space. Um, so it is worth thinking about, you know, what do governments mean when they talk about digital sovereignty? How do you balance the free flow of information and data with social um, stability. Now, the second issue um, I want to bring up is disruptive technologies. So, you know, by definition, any new emerging technology has the potential to fragment the internet. Um, So we can't always be living in fear. 
Uh, new IP was first proposed by China Mobile, China Unicom, and Huawei um, in the ITU. Um, this is one example. We talked about 5G, and Shantiko also mentioned IoT as some other examples. Now, such new protocols and new technologies, um, I think they really ride on the success of the internet. Um, they're driven as well by commercial or even political objectives that might not be compatible with the original recipe for you know, the internet's success. So the success of these new technologies might be determined more because they're riding on top or even through the internet's infrastructure than by their actual goals. So let's, let's talk about new IP for a second. Um, if it were to carry out its ambitions, um, it would take many years, perhaps even decades, to build the necessary infrastructure from scratch. And even then, it may not even um, be able to scale in the same way that the internet did for the reason that new IP emphasizes control and centralization. So I mentioned before the features of the internet, you know, open, decentralized. Um, these are what contributed to the internet's success. And if you want to rebuild and replace the core infrastructure, it would be very costly. And the more you over-design an architecture, the more you have to pay for all the bells and whistles. So this is part of the reason why standardization bodies such as the IETF, they prefer to work using more of an incremental approach um, when making changes to the internet protocols and standards to ensure its stability. Now, the third issue I have is growing concerns of internet security and its relation to public safety. We're seeing um, a proliferation of draft cybersecurity laws. There's a trend of governments widening their scope and seeking greater powers to directly intervene in cyber threats. So sometimes, uh, you know, you're used to this could be in the form of building defensive walls in the name of national security or justifying control over cross-border content. One recent example that I have, a um, very, very recent one, is the Australian Home Affairs, who proposed draft laws that give the government powers to intervene in what they call exceptional circumstances when there is a threatening attack scenario. And, and these powers are also very broad. So this brings me to my last and final point. In sum, what we're looking at is really the erosion of trust. The erosion of trust in the internet and its ability to function continues to be a threat. The lack of understanding or even misunderstanding of how the internet works and how the internet ecosystem works together amplifies this mistrust. There's no easy solution for this, but I guess for a start, you know, what we're doing today um, and what we're seeing more is more dialogue is needed between all the various stakeholders to find the right balance and also to make sure that any action taken is open and transparent. Thanks very much. Very good points, Joyce. Uh, I think a lot of food for thought for discussion, which I'll come back to you in a bit. Uh, Nelsie, you mentioned a, a, already a few areas. Um, if it's uh, for you to recap, just one or two key points you want the participants to take away, what do you think from your perspective, the government perspective, would be key risks or threats to internet fragmentation? Yeah, thank you. So. Generally, there is already existence of internet fragmentation. And this, this is to do with the rollout itself, with the network, for example, in Vanuatu. So not every people or not the whole Vanuatu is experiencing internet access or services. So in our own definition, there is a fragmentation you know, that comes with the network itself the rollout and the cost. So if we to go further technically, then that's another layer of challenge to internet fragmentation. That is, this is again, our general views. And that's already another issue for the government to consider and contribute on in terms of their policy direction. So it's very important for discussions to happen at the national level and importantly, for the technical and even general leaders to discuss what is expected and what could be done for us to continue to promote a good value, a good um, internet connection across the country. Thank you, Darcy. Um, and, and over to you, Bill, as well. Um, what do you think are risks or threats to the internet?
I want to show my slide, so please go to my slide. Okay, uh, I, I want to say that in the beginning, that uh, 5G do not flag in term, uh, flag in term, but uh, enhance the local performance. In the left hand side, uh, you can see that for our operator, we just want to use 5G to enhance the mobility, the throughput, the latency, and the quality of the user's uh, performance. But we do not want to challenge the internet. So we always connect to the internet for the people to people or, uh, or equipment to equipment trans uh, communication. So we always, uh, for example, we always do the horizontal communication with the TCP IP, with the, the same DNS. And, uh, for the private 5G network, actually we only use private 5G network as a private network, as a uh, intranet network. So it's no harm to the internet. It's just the enhance to the internet. And uh, then, what I want to say is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the other direction. Uh, in the technical point of view, if you find that you use uh, uh, the right hand side, you, you use a VPN to isolate your network, you have an isolated server network. However, the VPN is easy to jump uh, jailbreak. And also for the 5G, and later on we will 6G. 6G we will use a satellite or the US platform in the, in the sky. So you cannot block from the territory you have. So for example, in China, in you, uh, you, you can only use a great war to uh, isolate network. But if you find that you have 6G in the satellite and uh, provide uh, the Wi-Fi service direct to your user, then you cannot protect the, the user or you cannot f uh, f filter all the information fr from the user from the UL firewall. So for a technical point of view, you, it's, it's not easy or it's, it's not possible to break the the internet or isolate the internet because technically we are in <coughs> have the other solution to uh, join the internet together. This is my point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That's very interesting and uh, very insightful, especially when it comes to 6G. And that might give uh, even more challenge or headache for some governments who want to control uh, some aspects. Um, I'm mindful of time and we want to do some discussion with the uh, participants. Uh, Champika, we'll come back to you based on the questions, but uh, Kenny, do you mind if we can have some questions or any comments from the participants? Yeah, sure. Uh, may I ask a question to the floor? Okay, if you have any question regarding to, to the second topic we discussed, what do you think are the major threat or risk to be to fragment the internet? And if you have any question, or do you want to share any view regarding to what the panelists just mentioned, please go to the mic and say your name and your affiliation. Thank you. Any question? Okay, no more question from local. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then let's go to Chapika first, uh, come back to what you were sharing. If you don't mind summarizing just quickly, because um, we lost your audio for a bit. We can't hear you, Champika. Okay, we can't hear you, but let's try again in a bit. 
Um, but I have a couple of interesting questions from the current discussion. The first one is an uh, interesting question from uh, the interesting point that Bill raised about you know going forward for 6G um, when it comes to satellite providing internet service directly and, and governments cannot block like using a firewall. I'm, I'm curious um, whether there's any one participants in the room who might offer a government perspective uh, and also for Dalsi, from your perspective, um, when it comes to protecting citizens, um, do you think this would create uh, even a stronger perception by governments to have to protect their citizens? And, and if they're not able to do that via the, the normal route, like say firewall or DNS blocking, um, would that what, what kind of challenge do you think is going through uh, the government's perspective? I'm just curious, uh, Dalsi, do you have any thoughts on this? And also from participants in, on, in, in the room. Go to Dalsi first, right? Yeah, Dalsi first, please. Dalsi, any thoughts on this portion? Long-term 6G, might have a challenge for governments when it comes to protecting citizens. Yeah, I think for small island states, the going five G, six G is is, uh, is it's a dream. But I think it's going to take a lot of time to get there, given the realities we are facing today that we're still rolling out. Um, and trying to get connect and connect the population with all forms of um, ICT connectivity and not just internet. Thank you. Got it. So, uh, well, I I would agree uh, in the sense that for governments, it is taking it one step at a time. Uh, any any thoughts from the room? You know any. Anyone from, from the room we willing to share your soul? Uh, we have five minutes left, and especially from the public sector who are willing to share your view from regulator point of view or from, from policy point of view. Regarding to, to 6G, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, no question, no participant. Okay. Okay. Then let's, let me ask another question or rather discussion point, which I felt was also very interesting. Um, I think it's tied, it ties to um, the portion about mistrust um, and, and, and the need for dialogue. Uh, I think the starting point where, where we all talk about the internet being important, um, a single global internet is important. I think everyone starts from this same perspective. But then things start to break down. A lot of it is because, for example, when there are new proposals, uh, new technologies, even for 5G, for example, um, people don't really understand the intention behind why we're introducing new technologies, for example. And, and also when it comes to the need to protect citizens, um, the need for security, public safety, uh, there is a inherent mistrust in the sense that, oh yeah, I need to protect my citizens' data. Uh, so, so there is a mistrust in the sense that, oh, may maybe the operators or the, uh, the service providers, they are going to do something malicious with my citizens' data. So there is that mistrust, which then re potentially results in um, that, the, the thinking that there will be fragmentation. Um, and I'm curious from uh, other part, uh, the panelists. Uh, Joyce mentioned the need for dialogue. Uh, that's very important. I would like to ask the panelists for your view. You know, what do you think is a good way forward uh, when it comes to these aspects? Uh, maybe we can go from. Uh, we can come back to Joyce last because she already mentioned. Maybe we can start from Champika. Uh, just a reminder, we have three minutes left. Three minutes. Yeah, so this is actually closing. We use this to close. So what do you think is the way forward, you know, when it comes to these aspects, the need for dialogue, but there's also so much mistrust. Um, even with new technologies, there's a mistrust on the, the, the intention behind the technologies. 
So any thoughts on the way forward? Champika, please. Okay, still can't hear you, Champika. Uh, okay, let's move to Bill. Uh, I think always, uh, we, we always dialogue to to public, uh, to the government, uh, to find a rule or to find a policy to benefit uh, our network. And uh, I think the, the transparency to government, uh, to the public, and uh, to find the way to uh, surveillance the people due to the public safety is needed to, uh, for my po point of view. Thank you. That's insightful, Bill. Uh, let's go to Delcy. If there is a technical way to address this, that will be really good. Otherwise, we'll still have to continue to work together and to trust each other. And also remember at the back of our mind that internet is there to provide an avenue for us to dialogue and to discuss and make development. Thank you. Thank you. Let's come back to Joyce. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, I think I can. what I can do is maybe do a plug-in for Internet Society. So ISOC, uh, they recently came up with this thing called the Internet Way of Networking. Um, and they kind of built or developed this toolkit, which is, you know, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit which basically is to help guide policymakers, you know, when you are analyzing a law or making some kind of policy decision, what might be the impact to the internet? And I think that's something that could be useful for people as a starting point, you know, as you're going through the process. Um, and when you are trying to think about what are the questions that you need to ask um, in terms of the consequences and the impact of certain um, laws, legislations or policies, this is, possibly um, something that can be very helpful. Thanks, Joyce. I'm not sure whether we can still hear Champika. Let's try for a few seconds. Time is up. Okay, we can't. Then let's close the session. I think this is very helpful and very insightful. Um, the When it comes to talking about internet fragmentation, I think we all agree that internet it's important to keep it a single, global, interoperable. The principles behind it are important. We, but at the same time, we are challenged in the sense of uh, the, the growing fears of uh, mistrust. Uh, the, and, and it's important for us to dialogue across different stakeholders uh, to understand the objectives or intentions behind, say, new technologies, just like Bill mentioned, um, from an operator's perspective, is to improve a service. Uh, different stakeholders uh, use different tools to uh, want to achieve different things, but we all agree on an open, free internet is important. Um, so that's my takeaway. And to address the issue of uh, eroding trust, we need to continue to dialogue. And I want to congratulate uh, TWIGF for establishing this platform that allows us to continue to dialogue with one another. So with that, we'll close. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for being here with us. Okay, it's shut down. Okay, thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank, thank you, speakers, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.